College football week 12 recap brought to you by Tunica, Mississippi, the South's premier sports gambling destination. They got six awesome sports books down there. Fitz Casino, Hollywood Casino, Samstown Casino, First Jackpot Casino, Gold Strike Casino, and Horseshoe Casino. Six of them. You can find more information over tunicatravel.com. Go check that thing out. You can also check us out over at winningcureseverything.com. Everything you need to know about us. Social media, YouTube, podcasts, our picks, everything else. Winningcureseverything.com. If you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Help us out a little bit. We got a special guest. I'm Pops. Not Chris. Pops is here. Chris is is gone. He is in Disney World. Here, let's make sure we got we got that mic where you can actually hear you. So, it, get, give me a test. Give can me. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we're good on that now. All right. So he's not used to that. This is my dad. So you want to go by Lee or James or, or what Lee. do you? We'll do Lee today. All right, Lee's good. Now I may I may just call you Pops, but either way. So let's uh, let's jump into this thing. Yesterday was. A dud in a way, but for the most part, kind of interesting. I mean, the Ohio State-Maryland game was interesting. We'll start off with that. So, Maryland fails to convert a two-point conversion. Which they should have converted. Which they should have converted. Don't forget, talking that mic. <laughs> they should have converted that. It, it was wide open, wide open pass. Uh, Pegrome, is that how you say his name? I, I, I don't even know. Uh, failed to convert that. He missed a wide-open guy, but on the day, Ohio State gave up 8.63 yards per play. That defense is atrocious. On the year, they are giving up 5.91 yards per play. That is number 85 in the country. That is tied with two other teams. Do you know the other teams? No, I have no idea. Rutgers and UCLA. Yeehaw. Yeah, it's, uh, it's real bad. It's I'm talking awful. Urban Meyer... Throughout the game, and I don't know how much of this you watched, constantly having headaches. He's throwing his headset. He's like he's bending over in obvious pain. He's done this multiple games this year. That's what I was going to say. I think we've seen this before. I and think not this is just this year. No, this was this was Florida back in 2010, right? Yeah. Like that's that's what this is leading to. He's now. Now, I have seen this before where everybody kind of counts him out, and then, I mean, does he beat Michigan this weekend? Like, I, it's not out of the realm of possibilities because if, if he beats Michigan, I think they're getting in the playoff. I don't know that they get in the playoff, even if they beat Michigan and beat them soundly. Because of, of how bad they've looked all year? Because of how bad they've looked all year, and you can't lose to Purdue – by four Three touchdowns. touchdowns. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, Especially this Purdue team that has now lost two in a row in three of their last four after beating Ohio State. They're five and six. They got to win at Indiana this coming weekend just to make a bowl game. Uh, and a lot of this could be, like I've also seen this, Tom Herman did this same thing when he knew he was getting the Texas job. He mailed it in. So, you know, how much of this is Jeff Brom just saying, okay. I'm going to Louisville. I'm, I'm going home. I don't care, whatever. Uh, they did put up a fight. I mean, they put up 44 points, but either way, that's, uh, that was not a huge game. Wisconsin did win that ball game, though. Uh, Ohio State, I don't know what to make of them. Like, obviously, they can score with anybody, but this puts them in the same conversation. Like, they're basically Oklahoma, right? Like, I don't think they're garbage. I think they could get stopped sometimes if they need them. Maybe. Maybe. But at the same time, like, this is another one of those, who have they actually beaten? Like, Penn State, and that's, who has anybody beaten this year? There are so many three-loss teams. There's only two teams in Power Five Nobody that have play. two losses. That's, Nobody can play anymore. No, it's, you've got your top eight, and then everybody else is, nah. Every, it's like nine, all in nine, bag yeah. and pull one out. Nine through 60 is the same team. Yeah. The same, like there, anybody can beat anybody on any day, except for the bunch that's down in the hundreds, like Arkansas, like we saw yesterday against Mississippi State. That but was terrible. That was a bad, bad ball game. Uh, here, I, I know this is one that that you had to enjoy. Ping pong. We're gonna go over to game number two that we uh, that, well, topic two that we'll discuss. Oklahoma State forty-five, West Virginia forty-one.
Taylor Cornelius, 30 out of 46, 338 yards, five touchdowns, two interceptions. He also had 13 carries for 106 yards and a touchdown. And my favorite running back name of the entire year, <laughs> Chuba Hubbard. 26 carries, 134 yards. He had five catches for 24 yards and one touchdown. This sets up Texas in the Big 12 title game, and we'll get to Texas next. But West Virginia on the road is a completely different team from West Virginia at home. Which, which leads to Oklahoma. Which leads to Oklahoma going to Morgantown next week. We know that Oklahoma cannot stop anybody. Is West Virginia going to be able like to... like West Virginia can't stop well, they, anybody. Especially not on the road. Yeah. Like, they're, they're terrible on the road. Um... What what do we make of Oklahoma State extending the bowl streak and, and like this was fun to see Taylor Cornelius a fifth year senior he, he won the starting quarterback job nobody really thought that he would what what do we make of this like it do you I don't know what to make of West Virginia I don't know what to make of anybody in the Big Twelve nobody can play <laughs> but this goes across I'll the keep, country right I keep saying it nobody can play yeah that's uh that's what I they can all play offense everybody's learning how to play offense in the seven on seven camps when they're in high school well that's something that i like in my top 10 it's something i'm going to point out so I, i've got numbers up here that kind of distinguish between you know it, defense and offense and it, you'll see that here in a little bit but i if you can't that people have let's move off of oklahoma state let's move off of that let's jump into texas texas 24 iowa state 10 tom herman knows that defense wins games. Now, he doesn't have the team that he wants just yet. But, but yes, there. Yeah, he, they outgained Iowa State yesterday 405 to 210 yards. The rushing yards difference was 179 to 62. Like, that is, as we have always said on the show, run the ball, stop the run. You're going to win more games than you lose if you do that. Sam Ellinger went out with an injury that's kind of scary. It's a it's an AC joint. Did you see what this was? Something with his shoulder. Something with his shoulder. Um, but Shane Bichelle came in, 10 out of 10, 89 yards, one touchdown, and they ran the ball effectively the whole time. Like, it, this game was never in doubt. It was 24-3 to three before Iowa State scored a, a late fourth-quarter touchdown. Uh, and Texas winning this game, and then if they beat Kansas this week, then Texas will be in the Big Ten or Big 12 championship game against either Oklahoma or West Virginia. So at this point, Texas owns the tiebreaker over Oklahoma. So if both of them have two losses, Texas gets in. And now that West Virginia has lost a second conference game, if they lose to Oklahoma, they now have three, and now you have Texas-Oklahoma in the Big 12 championship game. Again. Which is, it, everything was set up for the Big 12 to cannibalize themselves and... West Virginia to to win in Morgantown over Oklahoma and then play them again the next week in Arlington and then lose that one because West Virginia at home is a different team than West Virginia, you know, elsewhere. So, at will you know, I'm going to skip ahead. I'm going to skip ahead. We got these out of the way. Let's move over to Oklahoma. I should have put that in there. Oklahoma 55, Kansas 40. Now, before we start talking about Les Miles, before we bring up the hat, Oklahoma can obviously score. But they gave up 40 points at home to Kansas. They can't him up a pig in a ditch. Did you see <laughs> the yards per carry that, that Kansas got? No. 9.7 yards per run yesterday. 330-something yards rushing. It was the most ridiculous thing because... So I've got the, the Apple TV, and I've got my iPad, and I've got my laptop, and I've got like six games on at a time. And I'm watching this game when it got to be 35-24. to 24. It, it was right before Kansas scored that, that touchdown to make it 24. And Kansas could move the ball almost at will on this team. So I looked up yards per play. Oklahoma gives up 5.8 yards per play which is actually better than Ohio State. They are number 78 <laughs> nationally. Um, and we'll get into more about the yards per play thing, but like it, ESPN has been shouting for months now 
it feels like, probably just weeks, that Oklahoma is one of two or three teams that could give Alabama a ball game because they can score. Oklahoma won a 28-21 to 21 overtime game against Army because Army kept the football for like 41 minutes of the, or 40, it was almost 45 minutes of the ball game. Oklahoma had it for 15 minutes. If you cannot stop somebody from running the football, Alabama, Clemson, Michigan, Notre Dame, those teams will eat you alive. If Oklahoma does win out, do they belong in the playoff? I don't think so. It's, now, what would be a reason to put them in, like just for the stylistic challenge? What you've got with Oklahoma this year is the same thing that you had with Oklahoma last year. Well, yeah. They're, they're not going to give you anything that anybody else out of the Big 12 wouldn't give you. That's true. So. And it, it to say that, it's kind of the same thing with Washington State, right? Only Washington State is a – they are a better defensive team. They're a little bit better defensively. But how much of that is playing in the Pac-12 against <laughs> – you know? <laughs> like, that's I mean, true. Like, the fact that Ohio State plays in the Big Ten – and they still give up the 85th most yards per play in the country is just astounding. Like, it's it's unbelievable. Because you, you're playing Michigan State, and you're playing Rutgers, and you're playing, you know, like, how do, how are you giving up that many yards? Uh, just bananas. Uh, let's talk about the, the big game of the day. Game day did not go here, but this was in the Bronx. It was at Yankee Stadium. Notre Dame 36, Syracuse 3. Eric Dungy went out early with an injury. Obviously, that played into the game, uh, but I don't think it would have made any difference whatsoever. He brings an awful lot to their offense. Is it just from a leadership role? or well, it's, it's from a leadership role, but in addition to that, he runs the football a lot. And a lot better than Tommy DeVito. And a lot better than DeVito. See, I feel like DeVito is better fit for – for Baber's offense, I don't think he's ready for it. He's not. He's still too young. Yeah. So I I think Syracuse, I believe, will be better next year. Like at they they're getting some transfers in that will be eligible next year. Their recruiting class is is much better. They they're going to be a better team. They're like another year in Baber's system. Uh, what they've done this year is pretty astounding. Like at, at Syracuse, winning the number of games that they have is just nuts. Uh, the Yards differential here, 463 for Notre Dame, 234 for Syracuse. How do you feel about this? Syracuse kicked a field goal with 10 seconds left in the ballgame. Like, at that point, I mean, why not just go for the score? A 28-yard field goal. Just so you can say you didn't get shut out. Like, is that is that the whole – like, why do we want football to – I don't know. It, 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 seeing that, like – Yes, to take away or to take a shutout away from somebody, there's a little bit of pride in that, right? Yes. But it just seems kind of ridiculous. Doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> but none of it matters. With ten seconds left in the ball game, none of that mattered. Like you knew who the better team was in the first two minutes of that ball game, and it yeah. was never going to be close. Notre Dame was focused on this game. Uh, they're a really good football team, and people have been. People have been talking about whether or not Michigan would deserve to go in over an undefeated Notre Dame team, which is just a ridiculous narrative since Notre Dame beat them. Now, the other side of this is if Notre Dame were to lose this game, okay, then do you have an argument? Because Notre Dame still... I don't think so because Notre Dame changed quarterbacks. Yeah, and, and Notre Dame's better. Offensively, they are much better than they were when they played Michigan. Ian Book is, and Chris and I talked about this in our previews early in the season, or, or well, before the season. Before the season. How we felt like because Wimbush was just such a terrible passer, Brian Kelly's offense requires somebody that can actually accurately throw the football. And Book showed multiple times last year. I mean, he was the hero of, of the comeback against LSU. It's It was basically and, – and it didn't get nearly the play that, that Tua versus Jalen did for Alabama, but it was the same situation. You got a guy that's your, your team leader that 
is a playmaker. He can run the football. Not great throwing the football, but he's serviceable. You know, and, and he led him to a good record last year. But you see the difference in this football team when you've got a guy that that can run the plays from the offensive coordinator. Well, it's it's just different. There's too many defensive guys around now that understand what all the old coaches in the old SEC knew. Stop the run. Yeah. And make the other team beat you throwing the football. Yeah. And if you don't have somebody that can throw it. At, then you can run into problems. You're in trouble. At, at any point. At any point you can run into problems. Let's move on to the ACC. We've got our, our championship game set. Clemson 35, Duke 6. Uh, Duke was actually up 6 to nothing uh, early in this game, after the first quarter. <laughs> Real early. And then <laughs> and then it just all went away. It was 14-6 to 6 at the half. Trevor Lawrence looks unbelievable. Um, David Cutcliffe came out afterwards and said that this is the best team that he has faced in his 11 seasons in Durham. Do you buy that? Is this a better Clemson team than the Clemson team that won the national championship? I personally don't think so, but they're not far off. They So talent-wise, I think they have more talent now than they did. I think the quarterback is still a little inexperienced, but – Lawrence, I believe, is a, a better true passer. But he's getting there quick. He's getting there. He's definitely getting there. Um, but I, I just – there was something about that team two years ago that I don't know that this one has. Now, this one does have a, a killer instinct, right? So yeah. when they when they smell blood in the water, they are, they are going for the kill. But they haven't played anybody that can punch them in the mouth. Like, at, with Duke, it's like, you know, okay, well, they, they hit you with – with socks on, you know, <laughs> like that's it, it wasn't a whole lot. Um, had Duke scored a couple of touchdowns early, maybe then you might have a different story. But the only difference that I see in this this Clemson team is that they don't have Deshaun Watson, and it's not from a talent standpoint; it's from a leadership standpoint. Yeah, um, it's who is the leader of this football team, right? And and I don't know that it, they didn't have it last year. Like, they, Kelly Bryant, they people would say that yeah, he was the leader was of the team. Leader, but he wasn't. But he wasn't. Um, and I don't know who it is this year. Like, I, I'm kind of surprised that things didn't implode a little bit when they switched from Bryant to Lawrence because of the way that everything went down. But, you know, when you're winning, everything feels pretty good. When they escaped Syracuse, I think that's what... Well, and add to that the fact that Dabo is such a player's coach. Oh, yeah. All those kids love him to death. And and they'll go to war for him. And they'll go to war for him. So. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, Pitt 34, Wake 13. Not Pitt, surprising. Pitt is on a six-game winning streak. They've, they've covered six straight. They can run the football, although Wake did. I mean, they just put eight guys in the box and said, you're going to have to throw it. And they did. And like, they, they were did. able to do it. Uh, Pitt still ran the ball, I think, 48 times, and it was 3.3 yards per carry. So, like, you know, take for that what you will. Uh, they're, they're not going to give up on the run, but if you make them throw it, they got a guy that can throw it. Does Pitt have any chance of beating Clemson? Like, obviously, they've got Miami this week, and it's at Miami, and Miami just secured their bowl game with a win over Virginia Tech, which – that that is getting ugly in Blacksburg quickly. Um, what happened to Justin? I don't think it's so much Fuente. I think I think Bud Foster has kind of because this is a lot of this is defensive. Yeah, but they've also and Chris and I talked about this before the season. Virginia Tech had like seventy five percent of their roster are underclassmen right now, and they lost a ton of guys on defense before the season even started lost like three more starters in the middle of the year. Like they've just they're super inexperienced. They lost their starting quarterback back against Old Dominion and he hadn't come back yet. So, you know, I mean it's is bad stuff. It's bad stuff down there right now. Uh I would not be shocked to see some staff changes and I wouldn't be shocked to see Bud Foster gone. Like I know that's that's crazy, but he's been there forever. 
if they are figuring out that he is not meshing with with Fuente and what they're trying to do on offense, then it might be time to bring in some new blood. It, the Virginia Tech defense had its spots in the latter years of Frank Beamer, but there were still times that they would absolutely get run all over. And it was not a, a Beamer problem. It was a defense problem. Yeah. And they brought in an offensive guy to fix that side of the ball. Well, I mean, when your starting quarterback goes down and, you know, your recruits are still really, really young, like obviously you got to have time to, to build it back up. In his first season, he went 10-4 and four and went to the ACC championship game and nearly beat uh, Clemson, you know. And that was the national championship year. So last year, you know, it uh, fall off but go to a bowl game. This year, no bowl game. No nothing. Like, it's <laughs> it's bad juju. Uh, but back to Pitt and Clemson. Does Pitt have a shot at all of, of possibly punching Clemson in the mouth? To quote that great American poet, Yogi Berra, 90% of this game's half mental. Yeah. So, yeah, they got a chance if Clemson doesn't show up mentally. Is there a chance that, that they don't show up? Because that... I mean, they haven't had a lot of spots that they have to get up for, right? Like, it, I mean, you, you kind of have to manufacture storylines to, like, get these guys interested in playing. Either that or they just play out of pride. I mean, yeah. I mean, for an ACC championship game, that's something to play for. Yes, it is. Because you, you saw it with Florida State years ago when they played Duke in the uh, ACC championship game. If they, like, when they played Duke early in the year, it would have been 35 to 10, something like that. Instead, in the ACC championship game, it was 70 to 3. So, Clemson is immensely more talented. If if Pitt is able to run the football, I think they got a shot. But, I mean, the line on this thing is going to be four touchdowns easy. Well, and I don't think they can run it. And I don't no. think Clemson will have to put eight in the box to stop it. Uh, No. No, as a matter of fact, I think they could probably stop it with their down four. <laughs> UCLA 34, USC 27. Ugly. Clay Helton on if he will return told a reporter, that's a great, uh, a, a great question for Mr. Swan. The athletic director. Yeah. Um, is he gone? I mean, how much does a, a Pac-12 championship and a Rose Bowl championship in your first two years buy you? There. I go back to my old solid. Nobody can play anymore. If you stick with him one more year, he may win you another Rose Bowl. Yeah, I mean, it's because possible. nobody out there can play. It's That's what's crazy. Like, USC, I feel like, is held to a higher standard than just Pac-12 standards. But the other side of this is if you look at their recruiting rankings right now, I mean, they've got, you know, five four stars and like eight three stars no five no five stars like that that is a telling sign but usc is one of those that normally jumps in at the last minute and gets them but now with the early signing period in december what do you make of this i i think he's probably gone because i think for usc to become successful again i think they have to go outside of the family again but where do they go that is a fantastic question. I was actually going to ask you that. <laughs> I don't. I, so the rumor is like James Franklin might have worn out his welcome in College Station, but I think he's always been a Northeastern guy. Yeah. So, but but if you've got if it's a good coach, you don't necessarily have to have ties to that place. You go out and hire you a staff that has ties to that place. If you've got the guy, like the head guy, that is a fantastic coach. It doesn't matter where they're from or, or what they do or what they know. Like Joe Moorhead at Mississippi State, he is already out recruiting what Dan Mullen did in his nine years. And Mullen had, you know, his ties to the Southeast and all that kind of crap. Well, Moorhead had nothing, but Moorhead hired guys that had the ties. If you've got a guy that you believe in, I don't think it matters. But now saying that, I don't think you go hire Neil Brown from Troy to go out to USC. Like, and, USC's a bigger job. And that's part of the problem with Clay. Yeah. Clay's a Southeastern guy. Oh, yeah. Even though he spent some time on the West Coast. I mean, uh, it, it, 
Yeah. It, uh, now, do they – I don't know who you go with. I mean, T, T. Martin, like, if they don't fire Clay Helton, you got to get rid of T. And you got, But the problem is, like, then you lose whatever recruits you got because T is about the only one recruiting out there. Like, that USC thing is a dumpster fire – Waiting to happen, and it that game yesterday with UCLA and them felt like two programs just passing in the night. Yes, like that's exactly what it was. It was UCLA is on the comeuppance, and USC is is headed back down, and I don't know when they'll be able to get it fixed. Uh, Maybe they could hire Lane again. Boy, that would be something, wouldn't it? <laughs> hey, I'm all for it. Like I, anybody, any Power Five program that wants to hire Lane Kiffin, please, you will give me content for years. Alabama 50, Citadel 17. Now, obviously, this isn't one that we would normally talk about, uh, but it was 10 to 10 at the half. It was a huge national story. Everybody's on upset alert, and, oh, my goodness, what's going to happen? Well, I mean, we saw what happened in the second half. 40 to 7 in the second half. Alabama finally woke up. Have they played an 11 a.m. game this year? Yeah, they've played a couple. And No, they played. they played Arkansas. But that was an SEC game. I think they were fired up for that one. It, this was just a dead spot for Alabama. Like between after LSU and Mississippi State, two emotional defensive, you know, just grind them out games. Then you got this dud right before you play Auburn and then Georgia. So, I mean, what do you kind of expect, right? So, there was no brace for Tua. He looked much healthier than he has in weeks. Yes. He was running around, scaring every Alabama fan to death. When will SEC teams stop scheduling lower-level triple option teams because of cut blocks and the risk of injury? Well, in Saban's defense, when they scheduled this game, the Citadel wasn't playing the triple option. But, yeah, that's it. <laughs> they weren't running it. I, I actually – so my wife – brought that up to me yesterday. She was watching, and she sees these guys go at the Alabama linemen knees. And she said, why would they even schedule this game? And I said, really? Yeah. Uh, because, well, because I kept pointing out, obviously. I'm, like, you see what they're doing? Like, it's, you know, it's dangerous. Like, if somebody's going to get their knee taken out. And, you know, several guys did have lower leg injuries, and you hate to see that before uh, rivalry games and SEC title games and whatnot. But, um I told her that when the game was scheduled, which was eight, nine, ten years ago, that Citadel was not a triple option team. And now they are, but the game is on the books. And after the Georgia Southern game back in 2011 with the uh, the shit through a tin horn statement, like, no, I don't think Saban did this one on purpose. No. I don't think he ever wants to play a triple option team before Auburn. What was or, the... What was the note that they put up yesterday? Oh, Peter Peter Burns you're talking yeah. about? Where he said uh, there's there's three, three times that you don't want to play a triple option team. That is the first game of the season, the last game of the season, or anywhere in the middle of the season. <laughs> <laughs> like You just don't want to play them if you don't have to. Now, the good thing is that Georgia will get to play one that is a little bit bigger and better uh, this week before the SEC championship game. So... But I don't think that Georgia Tech has to do the same things that teams like the Citadel do, right? When you're going up against, like, when you were completely outmanned, just uh, the weight difference is so high, you are going at the knees every time. You are you were going for cut blocks, like, down the field, and you and I talked about this before. They they don't they don't call it anymore. It's you you can't do it five yards past the line of scrimmage, right? Right. But they don't call it anymore. So, like, even in the secondary, these guys are, are still doing cut blocks. Well, nobody calls anything anymore. Uh, you, you're right about that. That's Except it. targeting. Yeah. They, they, will, they will drop a flag on targeting, like, if you breathe on somebody the wrong way. Heartbeat. But will, I mean, will they ever stop scheduling triple option teams because of that, because of the risk of injury? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think you can avoid it. It's, it all comes back to money and who you can get to play you at home that doesn't expect a game in return. And there are very few, and, and the FCS is full of triple option teams. And the reason that they're full is because they're all undermanned. 
Yeah. And they try to do things that will allow them to be competitive. And that's one of the things that you can do to be competitive. Yeah. Just bring something that nobody sees but once a year. Yeah. So. And that's how you end up in 10-10 ball games at halftime with the number one team in the country. Yes. Because they had not seen it at all this year. And well, I, I think their defense played well. Um, not Citadel with, or Alabama? Alabama. Yeah, I, th- I thought it was with fine. What, with what they were facing, it, it, their problem did not seem to be defensive intensity at all or a lack of understanding what they were playing. Their problem seemed to be that their offense didn't show up. It's the same thing yeah. that they went through after they built a 14-point lead with Mississippi State. Yeah. It's almost like... <laughs> like they were put on a pedestal and... Well, it's almost like there's there's something going on with the calls that are being made to maybe keep them from scoring so much. Now, I had not thought about that. I- explain that to me. Like, what what would be the purpose of not scoring so much? Well, or is it maybe like giving teams uh, a glimmer of, of confidence before you demolish them when you get to them? <laughs> well, I don't know that it's it's giving teams a false hope, but you're not putting anything else on film for them to look at, number one. Okay, okay, number I do two, see that. You're going against what you have done all year, which breaks your trends. Okay. It makes people look at other things. So it, That is an interesting way of uh of looking at that. I had not thought about that. I thought maybe they were just playing against some pretty good defenses. It's an old school Like yesterday process. I do feel like in the second half they had to open the playbook a little more. They did. And once they did that, I mean, obviously, they just ran off touchdown after touchdown after touchdown. And it was, at that point, it was done. Like, yes. the the first two touchdowns of the second half, one was a fumble return, the other was, uh, was a two-up pass or whatever. At that point, the game was done. They keep two out for just a little bit longer, and then fourth quarter comes, and it's Jalen time. Which, did that surprise you? He's back so quickly from an high angle sprain. Um... Yes and no. I, I thought maybe they'd hold him out another week. But I think what they said in the press conference after the ball game yesterday was that they wanted to get him some playing time just to knock the rust off. Yeah, because, and just in case you need him for Auburn or something like that. like yes. You don't want his first game action in a month to be against Auburn's defensive line. No. Like, that would be a disaster. Uh, let's move on from that. Let's talk about uh, – we we got to run through these fairly quickly. Utah 30, Colorado 7, and Washington State 69, Arizona 28. Uh, those two games, well, and then the other side of this, Washington beats Oregon State uh, by 19 or something. I mean, it was just whatever. They could have named their score, uh, and they named it a very short margin because Oregon State's new coach, Jonathan Smith, is Chris Peterson's former offense coordinator. Um, Colorado, Mike McIntyre fired this morning. We saw that. What does Colorado do? Like, do you, do you go with somebody that has Pac-12 ties that can get into California? Or do you go with somebody that has been the traditional guy for Colorado, which is somebody that has Texas ties? Like, I, I think what Kentucky did with Mike Stoops, where he said, all the SEC is going for down here. We're going to go for Ohio. Like, we're going to try and sell stuff to Ohio. Like, well, if you're in the Pac-12, do you try and sell the Pac-12 to people from Texas? Or do you just try and, like, what are the expectations here? Who can you who can you get? All depends on what the university wants to do. If the university wants to get in the football business, then they'll go find somebody either from Texas or California because there's just not an awful lot of high school talent in Colorado. There's not no. a lot. In well, and the best player that they've got is actually from Texas. Like, LaVisca Chenault is yeah. from Texas, and he hadn't played a whole lot this year, but McIntyre going from 5-0 and to 5-6 and this year was pretty interesting. So I, I thought maybe they would wait and see what happened in the Cal game 
They did not wait for that. It, this this dude went ten and four two years ago. Went five and seven last year. He's five and six this year. I think they are finally just done with it. And that on top of the, I guess, kind of hiding uh, domestic assault by one of his assistants uh, early in the se- or last off season, whatever it was. Just a train wreck situation over there. Washington State sixty nine, Arizona twenty eight. Gardner Minshew with seven touchdowns. Do you want to go to Alabama and be a backup, or do you <laughs> want to come out here and be a Heisman Trophy and, finalist and end up in New York? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty easy sell. But I, now, Chris and I have talked about this on the show, and I said the point like of him going to Alabama was he wants to go into coaching after he's done. Who better to learn from than Nick Saban? Unless you have been brought up in air raid systems your entire quarterbacking life and the guru of the air raid system wants you to come and play quarterback for him for a year. Yeah. Like, that is 100% the sell because I don't think anybody saw this coming from Washington State. Uh, This sets up Washington State versus Washington, the Apple Cup, for uh, that Pac-12 division, and then Utah handled the Pac-12 South. So... It will be Utah against one or the other, and Utah has played both of them already this year. Now, they lost both of those games. That's their two of their conference losses. Um, would Utah State, or you, would Utah have any chance against Washington State? Washington would, State actually plays a little defense. They are number 40 in the country in against uh, uh Against Pac-12 offenses. Well, against Pac-12 offenses, but 40 in the country in yards per play yeah. on defense. Pac-12 offenses have known to, to put up points. Yes. That's pretty impressive. Like, they are yes. they are really doing some good things. And, and and their points per game does not look bad. No, their their points per game is, is significantly bad. I mean, they gave up 28 to Arizona, but they were up like 55 to 14 at the half. Yeah. It was a disaster. And and Leach, of course, at halftime said, well, we're only about halfway there. And and everybody's going, God, is he going for 100? Like, no, he he was going to not get anybody hurt. Uh, because next week is, is the big game. They have not beaten Washington since he's been there. This could be the year. Where is like, that ball game? It is in Pullman. So, Washington going to Washington State could be interesting. Yes. Could be very interesting. Uh, they will be fired up in the Palouse for sure. UCF 38, Cincy 13. Did you watch any of this? I watched enough to know that uh, UCF's a good football team. Yeah, they absolutely are. At Cincinnati, three turnovers, two missed field goals, a turnover on downs. They had their spots. The yardage total makes it look like, eh, it might have been a closer game. 402 to 379. UCF actually uh, outgained them, but it was – not by much. It was not close, though. Uh, but the go- the ball game was never in doubt. No. Never in doubt. It was, what, 21-6 to six at the half, I think. And, yep. and UCF could have named their score. Um, yeah, it's a good football team. And and they changed coaches, and they still look good. They, they lost some NFL talent, and, you know, they, they are stockpiled there. Yes, now, they are. But... Is there any chance that they can actually sneak their way into the playoff? I already know, know the answer. Few minutes. I already <laughs> know the answer to that. But uh, to wrap up, Memphis beat SMU twenty-eight to eighteen. Houston beat Tulane forty-eight to seventeen. That sets up Memphis versus Houston for the AAC West for the right to go play against UCF. Memphis is the only team that has actually gotten close to beating UCF. They probably should have won that ball game at the yes. Liberty Bowl. Um, but, obviously, it started raining, and Memphis can't play in the rain for whatever reason. It's like the Wicked Witch of the West or something. Uh, Utah State 29, Colorado State 24. Hail Mary at the last second next. Uh, Jordan Love uh, threw a touchdown pass with about 40 seconds left in that ball game. That sets up Utah State against Boise State for the MWC Mountain Division. Fresno won the Western Division uh, last night, or the Mountain West West, whatever. <laughs> Uh, 23 to 14 over San Diego State. So you've got Fresno against the winner of Utah State and Boise State, which is actually the much more entertaining Group of Five conference right now. The Mountain yes, West is. is is a lot of fun. Uh, the AAC has been ugh. 
Well, what you have with with UCF and the AAC is the same thing that you had with Boise 10, 12, 15 years ago. Yeah. Where there was nobody else in their conference that could play with them. And when they changed conferences and stepped up their level of competition. Then you started seeing. Then you started seeing them have to get ready to play every week. And, and they're still not quite to. It didn't work out so well. Yeah. At where they're losing a couple of games a year and and all that. So it will be a, a, a fun weekend of football, to say the least. You're going to be back in tomorrow to go through that. But for now, we are going to run through um, our top ten and our playoff predictions. First, go to tunicaltravel.com. They got all the wonderful things on all their six sports books. And go over to winningcureseverything.com. We'll be back with our top ten and our playoff predictions. <laughs> 